The next category winner is the Villa category, and that was won by John Wardle Architects for Shearer's Quarters in Australia. Hi, John. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to use the, the microphone right. there. So tell us a little bit about yourself, about your practice, where you are, and then talk about this beautiful right. villa. Okay. Well, we have a practice situated in Melbourne, Australia. We're a, a practice of about 45 staff. We undertake sort of quite major commissions uh, from a lot of university and research projects. Um, some quite substantial office towers, the most recent one being a large Westfield Tower in the centre of Sydney. But we've always been a practice that at heart has felt that a lot of our identity is our residential work. And we've, as we've gained the, the momentum of doing larger and larger projects, we've still very much held on to our residential work, which we do lovingly. And this one's sort of like a little... It, was, it started off as a secret assignment. It was a, a little project really just for ourselves on this farm on an island off Tasmania. So tell us about the, the, the architectural approach you've adopted there and, and, and the place yeah. that it's set. Well, it's certainly one that has the luxury of being um, part of a larger equation. It's, certainly a, it's a property we've owned for 10 years, it's a, it's a, so it's been a very slow area of research and consideration before even considering building on the land. Um, it's a very important bit of land. It was um, one of the first land uh, grants in... in uh, Tasmania at the time to Captain James Kelly who was the founder of Tasmania's whaling industry and um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a site of quite historic importance and so to create a, a small residential building there on this site was seen as something we had to do with great care. So it appears as a shed at first glance it's pretty shed like but uh, once you arrive and it reveals itself it's something much more. So what is it on the outside? Is it was it clad in? Well, it's, it's clad in corrugated iron, which is sort of the, the traditional material for agricultural sheds. But as it reveals itself, it opens up to a completely timber-lined interior. And tell us about that material choice then. The outside, as you said, is a typical yeah. farmstead um, material. But the inside, that's what's quite striking about it, I think, is that every surface is timber. Yes, it's... It, it's, it's a project that started off with a very simple philosophy of a building that is a skillion at one end and a gable at the other and the way that the building would transform itself through this sort of series of geometric shifts from one building type to another. Once it unfolds and you get inside it, it's, um, it becomes much more complex. It's certainly, uh, it's completely wrapped in timber. The timber is set on this quite tight um, 750 millimetre grid and everything accords to the grid. All the windows, the doors, the joinery, the room dimensions, everything is set on this grid of, of short boards at 750 millimetres that wrap the entire interior. And um, it's, what's also interesting about it is it's, there's no sort of landscaping around it. It's just sort of sitting there yeah, on, the, on the grass with sheep wandering all around it. That's right. It's certainly a shed in a paddock. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's the type of building that would have never traditionally had a garden. There's a, there's a main homestead and we're establishing, we're sort of researching as to what kind of garden must have been there 140 years ago when they built the house. Um, but this is very much a shed and would only be sur surrounded by a paddock. So is this, would it, did you build it for yourself? Is it your yeah, own? our family. It, it is actually a Shearer's Quarters. It is for the Shearer's to stay in, but it's as well as that, it's family, friends and our staff who come down for a series of tree planting weekends and occasional studio sessions to get away from the other aspect of our life, which is being a, a very busy urban practice. We come down and have retreats here. We've planted 7,000 trees on the property. It's part of sort of our uh, endeavour and sort of the antidote to the, to the rest of everything we do as a practice. And what is the rest of your work, Lynn? You don't, you're not always designing these beautiful little houses in the landscape. No, no, no. As I said before, they're, they're generally much bigger buildings. In fact, it's fantastic to be rewarded for something which really is the smallest project that the office has undertaken for, for quite some time. Our, the scale of our buildings and the, the duration of them means that a, a smaller, more immediate project like this gains real interest. It's obviously a good grounding for research and testing of ideas and a project that had a very short time span. I mean, really, it was designed and completed in just over a year, about 14 months, I think. So, whereas some of our larger projects might be five or six years in the making. And it's called Shearer's Cottage, and you mentioned that Shearer's actually do stay there. So, oh, yeah. is, is that true? Yeah. yeah. Well, we had, there was the one old historic house, which is just forward of this, between this and the, the ocean edge. And we've shared, that's been shared by ourselves and the Shearer's and everybody else over the last few years. We're, we're about to restore and renovate that house. 
And then we decided, well, if we're going to do that, we really don't want to share that with the shearers. We better create a shearers' quarters first, which we'll live in while we're doing the much larger project of restoring the old house. So we're shifting between the two. So the shearers, they still travel around Australia and the oh, islands. Yeah. It's, it's the, the, the whole social culture of shearing and everything is a wonderful bit of theatre to be down there when actually all the shearers there, a team of seven or eight shearers and, and rouseabouts and wool classes and things, is and it's still this incredible bit of, of theatre that's um, such a, an important part of the whole rural ethos. And so when you're not in, on the island, where do you live? What's your in Melbourne, in a, in a suburban home in, in Melbourne. Yeah, quite a different existence. So this is a complete counterpoint to everything else that we do. And what's happening in Australia at the moment? Obviously in Europe we're all paralysed by this crisis, but yeah. has Australia escaped that? Are you busy? Well, it's interesting. We've been very busy. These, these last four or five years have been our busiest years ever. Our federal government particularly wanted to try and keep the economy moving by doing massive investment in infrastructure, particularly educational projects. And that's a core area of our work around Australia. So we, we've been incredibly fortunate and, and uh, participated in quite a series of major educational buildings for different universities around Australia. So that's the main thing we did, as well as doing this large tower in the middle of Sydney. So, but things are starting to slow down. Our, our both federal and state governments seem to be testing the way a little bit before working out what they do next uh, with the economy. So at the moment, it's, it's, there's a greater degree of uncertainty about the work for architects in Australia. And when I meet Australian architects, they, they tend to talk about a couple of hot topics, which is one is the lack of water in Australia, and another mm. is suburbanisation. A lot of the house projects we were judging the other day yeah. dealt with trying to infill suburbs and stop the sprawl. So are those two of the preoccupations of your office as well? Oh, they certainly are. I mean, any project, and this is just a, a very small example of it, um, re re harvesting of water and retention of water, either through um, the aspect, landscape aspects or is part of the, the physical realm is a, is a very big part of environmental uh, management. Um, and it's a, it's a, particularly in the urban projects, it's, it's become a really complex aspect of, of the work that's undertaken. Uh, certainly our cities are becoming much denser and I think there's some great work being done at the moment as cities reconsider opportunities for building back within, back toward the centre rather than spreading further out. And in Australia we've actually created some terrible urban sprawl over the years and it is a, it is a time for reconsidering the way that cities shape themselves and develop. And other cities grappling with that issue, I mean it's not an easy thing to do is it, but how hard are they working? To what various are they extents, I mean I, I think um, it, it's got to be something that's led by government who probably have huge pressures on them to allow cheap land to be developed at the periphery. It's an, it's an obvious and easy thing to do. And there's a great temptation to uh, accept that as a sort of a commonplace thing. But once we sort of value what infrastructure costs to serve outlining areas, maybe the equation is shifting a bit and governments have a greater realisation that it's better to invest back where the, in, the current infrastructure is situated within a city. Okay, great. It's been great talking to you. Fantastic. And congratulations on, on winning the category. Thank you very much. We're very pleased. Good yeah. luck for later. Great. Thank you. Thank you.